Hello everyone, today is Thursday, January 28th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week, you know what, I'm bringing this week in charts to you by me. <laughs> Check out my trading service, davelander.com slash trading service, and if you're new to the service, you can get started for just $47. If you've been around, uh, if you've been with the service before, and you'd like to come back, and just, uh, I'm a reasonable guy. Just say, hey, Dave, I was with you a while back, and I went off to chase some rainbows, and now I just want to follow the trend. Uh, can we do that? And I would say, of course, and I'll make you a really good deal. I guess before we talk about trading, we have to look at the disclaimer screen. Um, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, a line stolen from my friend Greg Morris, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff. Can happen between now and then. Rather than tell you what I want to talk about, I just I just think I'm gonna start talking. I, I woke up this morning really early, and I started working on my slides. And then up until the last minute, I was still working on them. And the theme is going to be why we do what we do when the markets go down. We're we're smart and we're motivated individuals. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today. The reason you're here is to try to learn something or try to gain some perspective. So you're motivated. And I just got back from Hong Kong, and I've learned that human nature doesn't change, and it doesn't matter what continent you're on. Humans are humans. And as I said in the column, one of the gentlemen I was talking to, very smart guy, um, very successful in his prior career, and now he's a trader, and he's been trading for quite a while, and he's pretty good at trading, but he's down 30%, just like the Hang Sing. And I think the reason that happens is that you, you end up in a bit of a denial, and so how do we stop that from happening? And... As I've written before, my wife has a way of oversimplifying things, and I appreciate her confidence in me, and that's kind of like a, a shot in the arm, but if there's some sort of honeydew, she's always like, all you have to do is, and it seems like it's going to be some little simple thing, at least in her head, and on the surface, that's all you have to do. But the reality is I end up spending at least a half a day, usually a whole day on some plumbing project and going back and forth to Home Depot or whatever. But it, it's never as easy as it appears on the surface. So all you have to do is, when it comes to trading, is follow your plan. And... You ask someone who's down 30% like the overall market, what's the plan? What was your plan? Well, they didn't have one. And I've talked quite a bit about failing to plan. I don't want to go too far into that. But the reason people fail to plan is because the moment you make a plan for trading, you have to admit that you could be wrong. And even if you do have a plan, once things start really going against you, it becomes harder and harder to follow that plan. I think Mike Tyson said it the best. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I was doing a little uh, reading, or rereading, I should say, from Leo Melamed this morning. Uh, Melamed on the markets is uh, where this uh, quote and some other good stuff comes from. In fact, it was to a point where I was looking at the um, the excerpt from a speech he gave in 1969. I actually found it on Melamed.com, LeoMelamed.com. And it was like my whole, pretty much everything I wanted to talk about today. And I reached the point where I was like, well, maybe I need to stop reading that because I don't want it to look like I just lifted uh, everything he said and begin talking about it. But a lot of what I'm going to say today is what he says when it comes to, to fighting the market. And, and he says, 
be a lover, not a fighter. And the problem is, once a market begins going against you, you begin to not follow your plan, thinking, okay, well, it's oversold, it's going to bounce. Or you begin to rationalize why you're correct and the market is not. The market can do whatever it wants. It doesn't always, as you know, do what you want it to do. And he says, when you fight the market, you rationalize your position is correct, even when the market screams that it is not. When all the facts contradict your opinion, when your instincts tell you to get out. And this, the aforementioned gentleman I was talking about in Hong Kong, it's like he felt like it was too late to get out. And my feeling is it's always darkest right before it gets more dark. And because he's down 30%, he felt like it, the market's down so much, it, it's bound to bounce back. And unfortunately, surprises do tend to happen in the direction of the trend. And so there's a bit of denial going on. There's also this, this worry, I think, that if you do get out at such low levels, and this is where it's, it's so funny because I'm reading Melamed or rereading Melamed this morning, and he was saying the same thing. It's like and this, this speech was written in 1969, by the way, where this uh, comes from, the quotes came, come from earlier, came from. And it's like there's this, this fear that if you do get out when you're down 30% or whatever the number is, that the market's going to turn around the next day and you're going to look like an idiot. Well, who cares? And, and what I try to tell people is, and, and this is where the trading psychology really comes in, is if you make as many decisions, passive ones instead of active ones, and I'm guilty too, okay? I'm watching a uh, position yesterday at a currency trade, and I'm like, Okay, uh, should I get out here? Should I get out there? I'm like, well, stop, Dave. What do you preach? Okay, just just follow the plan. Put that stop in place. Leave that stop in place. In this case, I just threw a trailing stop in and then went about my life. So let that trailing stop take you out. It took me out overnight. But if you sit there watching every little tick, you 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 try to think, you try to rationalize each little move. And you're not going to follow your plan or even your anything remotely similar to your plan. But if you make that a passive decision, so if the market hits that stop, it takes you out. So what I'll tell some people, like I'll get emails from people, Dave, I'm down 50 points in a stock. I'm like, good Lord, what was your plan? Obviously, you didn't have one. But what I'll tell them to do is, okay, set a stop. Uh, uh, you know, you're already down 50 points. Another point or two is not going to kill you. So set a stop an actual stop a couple points below the market and if the market takes you out it takes you out get a, go on and, and and get a go on with your life afterwards okay so it makes it a passive decision once you're once you've dug yourself so far into that hole then let it be a passive decision and not an active one but the way you get out of that situation in the first place is just don't do that Put that stop in place ahead of time. And I think when you become a lover of the trends, it's like I, I caught myself last night in a service. I was getting kind of excited. It's like, look how beautiful this market top is. But in a while back, I found myself apologizing quite a bit. And one of you um, people in here were kind enough to tell me, Dave, stop apologizing, okay? Is it going up? Is it going down? Or what do you think? But don't apologize for what you're seeing. And unless you're Bill Clinton, what it is is. So you do have to be a lover of the trend, whether it's up, down, up or down, I should say. Obviously, sideways is no trend. So it, it should make no difference to you whether the market is going up or down. It kind of made me think about the, the Volkswagen commercial. A couple of years ago during the Super Bowl where uh, 
the guy's so happy he's he's uh he takes on this Jamaican persona and he's like Julia turn the frown upside down and it's like so if you turn a chart upside down then it looks pretty damn good okay so sometimes it's all a matter of perspective so why can we deal with uptreads at least those with a little experience the 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 people who have traded for a while who do have some experience why could this guy follow the uptrend and do pretty damn good but when the market starts going against him what happens and and i don't have a quick answer on that and that's why i was late getting this presentation together but for some reason, I think it goes against our human nature when a market begins to go against us or go down like that. And one of the greatest things ever happened to me was being able to hook up with some old school traders early on. And we were following markets up, 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 up. It was great. And then the market began to tank. I was still kind of holding on to positions past. I was still sort of uh, not fighting the, the last war, but sort of like thought I was in the last war. And then the trader types. Okay, I hit it again. We'll see what happens. So when you gain a little perspective by flipping this chart over, and then usually what will happen is once we get into a serious downtrend in the market, I'll, I'll do a column where I'll flip everything over just to gain a little perspective. And one thing which is pretty cool is the persistency of this market has been phenomenal. And usually you don't see that persistency in the downside. And I was warning my Chinese brethren just last week that when you see such persistency on the downside, obviously charts flipped over here, usually it becomes, no pun intended, a Chinese water torture, and then you see – an accelerated move lower. Now, obviously, I got the chart flipped over. So when you are seeing the markets, or if you feel like you're fighting the markets, do something to gain some perspective. I used to race sailboats back before I had family and children and this market thing and this international uh, um, educational business and getting involved with hedge funds and all this other good stuff back before I started having to work 12 hours or more a day doing all these things, which I love to do. I'm, I'm I, sometimes I wake up and pinch myself. Can't believe I'm, I get paid to do this and I get paid to look at charts. And if I could find the next stocks that are going to take off or the next market that's going to move, then, then I will, be rewarded handsomely and I also enjoy teaching and I'm a bit of a I think we all have egos but it, it's great I, I like traveling the world it's fun so I'm not complaining I'm just saying that I had a lot more time on my hands years ago and I used to be able to uh, race sailboats and this guy here his name is David Balliard he's a he was our sailmaker or I guess he still is for the boats that are still racing with him and uh, we won a lot of races with him, and we won a lot of races without him. So make no bones about it. It was good to have him on the boat, and it does give you a little bit of an edge. But the real edge came in if you had David on your boat when the wind died out. And light air sucks if you've ever raced on a sailboat, especially in south Louisiana where it's, where it's hot, Africa hot and in Florida and some other places where we've raced. You just kind of drift there and you bake in the sun and it's just a horrible experience. It's not much fun. You sweat. <laughs> it's nasty. Sometimes, especially like you forgot your sunscreen or whatever, you just start uh, frying in the sun. But David would always tell us on the boat, love light air and it'll love you. And it's like all of a sudden a switch flipped with him and he got into the zone and it's almost like he was having like this 
out of body experience and he would just like slowly start tweaking the sails and he would make he would start adjusting the weight of the boat by okay you go sit on the low side you do this you do this and he just got into it so much and I'm like oh, this sucks how can he get into that and before you knew it he would get the boat moving now the boat would be moving like a half a mile an hour but if everybody else is just sitting there you'll start pulling away from the entire fleet in this light air so he's like love light air and I love you and I think that translates to the markets so you need to love trends whether that's an uptrend or a downtrend so love downtrends and they'll love you love the trend you're in okay and again I feel like I need to apologize unfortunately when a downtrend it is what it is now just kind of a side note here and this is from reading Melamed earlier today there's a fine line from being consistent to becoming obstinate okay so last summer and going and watch the YouTube especially the special reports that I did on YouTube but last summer I became concerned about this market because it was rolling over and more importantly I had signals that I follow such as the weekly bow tie and then I got some nasty grams one in particular somebody said have you thought about another line of work you've been wrong the market went back up so there's a fine line for being consistent and then that could turn into being obstinate now I wasn't being obstinate because I looked back and said look back to the charts and said okay well here's my plan if the market goes on and make new highs then I'm no longer a trend follower I'm a trend fire and then the other thing I did was I didn't pile on the shorts until I started seeing more and more setups and then I let the longs get stopped out and then we put some more shorts on so you have to love the trend you're in and, and, and again I found myself getting excited last night because these tops are so beautiful and then I felt a little bit of guilt for feeling that way after I recorded last night's trading service and I said you know what Dave this is this is this is what you do like salt and pepper pushing it it's what you do and you just have to learn to love the trend you're in now the short side sucks okay now I gotta be careful because here I am saying love the trend you're in and then I'm gonna tell you how it sucks it does suck because the retrace rallies are a pain in the ass but it comes with the territory and you just have to accept that as as part of the deal and that's why we scale out of positions along the way so if we get stopped out at least we're getting stopped out at either profit or we just losing some of those open profits okay so we're reducing that exposure as the market sells off so when the retrace rally comes it won't hurt as bad and one thing I got asked while I was over there by one of the guys in the MTA Hong Kong MTA guy asked me he, he was he came to the pre-conference and was saying well I could see based on what you're doing that you could end up with a lot of positions and I said yeah there's some truth to that but you're also scaling out and you're also paying attention to market conditions and you're paying attention to your war portfolio so if you end up with 10 positions on and none of those are hitting the initial profit target whether it be the upside or the downside you have to begin to ask yourself is there something wrong with my stock picking or is there something wrong with the market so when you go to put that 11th position on you need to really think twice about that and so right now relative to the market we've got a uh, four or five shorts on I forget we'll look at the portfolio and it's like I don't see a need to put a six month on or six one on or fifth one on today because one I didn't really like the setups that much anyway and number two I think we have enough on for now and as more of them or if more of them I should say hit the initial profit target then I'll start pulling some stocks off anyway so love the trend you're in and there's nothing wrong with trading a downtrend I left this in there for a couple of weeks ago 
say hello to my little friend. Unfortunately, we might have to do that. Now, I would like to uh, jump out to the charts in one second here. Uh, this was left over from last week, and this is the actual open portfolio. Minus one means we are short, and these are the stocks that we're short. And we'll take a look at that. I'd rather sh look at the charts on these before we jump into everything else. Um, okay. Okay, John asked a question to left. I would like to recall how wide the stop should be set. Is 1.2 times ATR sufficient? Uh, that's a long conversation in and of itself, or that's, that's two or three presentations on setting stops. If, and this is something that I was telling the MTA over there and, and um, the people at the, uh, at the, at the all-day seminar, when you're setting a stop, the way I set up, yes, it will look like an ATR, but I think trying to quantify that stop into an ATR could be quite difficult. So you have to ask yourself, where would you be wrong? And you also have to look at the, just eyeball the recent volatility of the market. And you have to at least try to survive that short-term volatility. Now, again, I don't want to digress too far into, into placement of stops because it is a bit of an art. It is a bit of a science. So um, I would say go out and watch the YouTubes for a little bit more on that. The only other thing I want to add, though, is when you're using a statistically-based stop, uh, because markets aren't normally distributed, that stop is going to be a lot wider than the market might actually need, okay? So you just have to ask yourself, where would I be wrong? And then you could back up all the way to the front of this presentation where I said, trade your plan. So... As I said earlier, bigger picture wise, as far as my bigger picture framework, I was bearish starting last summer and where I would kind of give up that stance or where I would definitely give up that stance is if the market went on to new highs and stayed there. Being right and making money are really two different things when it comes to the market or often two different things when it comes to the market. And you have to do a lot of things where you look stupid. Okay. Um, there's been quite a few whipsaws in this market going all the way back to 2009 where I started shorting stocks and I got stopped out of those stocks and the market kept going up and so I just started buying stocks again, okay? And that kind of thing has earned me the title trend following moron. And I think Greg Moore said it the best and I've said this a thousand times, I'll say a thousand more. Whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. So if you do get short or if you're long only oriented, which is there's nothing wrong with that, okay? I got some very good friends running a lot of money who are long only oriented. But if you're long only oriented and you begin to see the market roll over, it's okay to get out of the way, even if you have to get back in later on when it starts going back up. But if it doesn't go back up, then you have saved your funds. So whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. Okay, I'm going to jump into charts here. Um, the Again, if you want a, a delayed version of my service, then if you look at the sidebar on my website, you could uh, get that, and you'll get a log on right away. And you can see all these um, recommendations and everything with a little bit of delay. Uh, I say one week, it's going to be a minimum of one week because sometimes there's some current information or current positions that might, or current setups, I should say, that might carry over for more than one week. So as soon as those come off, the new services start coming up. So it'll be a minimum of one week delay. But I think it's a great way, if I say so myself, to kind of pay attention to what's going on. And you can see what I predicted a week or more ago, and then you can see what's actually happened by pulling up your charts today. So anyway. Okay, um, let's hop out to the charts here. And first thing, I like a black chart, so let me do that. That'll be an invisible chart there. Before we get into the overall market, let's just take a look at the portfolio. Oops, it blew up. <laughs> 
talk amongst yourselves again. Howard says, Dave, how goes it? It goes well. Okay. All right, Dathan, thanks for your help. Appreciate that. All right, let's see. All right, we're letting the TC come back up. If you guys want to start asking questions about individual stocks while we wait for this um, software to reboot, feel free to do so. All right, here we go. I guess I've added all this out in recording. Okay. So let's take a look at the portfolio real quick, and then we'll um, back out to the overall market, and we'll take a look at the sectors and all this other good stuff. So if you get the hindsight, you'll get the actual spreadsheet, the foresight and hindsight, and you'll see these um, setups in there. So this one hasn't really cracked just yet, and this is a bow tie, and the best bow ties tend to come off of major or sometimes even all-time highs. And so we back the chart way out. And longer term, this still might be a pretty good hold as a stock. I don't know that just yet. But following my swing to intermediate term patterns, to me it looks like a market that might be in trouble. And this is AIZ. So you can see that it made an all-time high here. As I've preached quite often, when a market is at an all-time high, anyone who, who has ever bought the stock is happy. Okay. But as it begins to crack, anyone who bought it from here, okay, is now at a loss. And as it begins to sell off, anyone who bought it above this level is now at a loss. And they then begin feeling the pressure. By the way, one thing that I talked about in my column, it, it's I feel bad for the individual who rode the market down and is still holding on as that Hang Seng has dropped over 30%, which we'll take a look at in one second here. I feel bad for him, but from a, I don't know if esoteric is the word, but from a bigger picture view of things, it's kind of it's kind of helps me to rest assured that human nature never changes. And technical analysis is based on reading the psychology of the market, reading the psychology of the participants, and that technical analysis will continue to work as long as I know that there are individuals out there that are letting their emotions take over, then technical analysis will continue to work. So I still have my work cut out for me. So anyway, this stock, you can see bow tied down and we really hadn't paid off that much just yet. It's kind of uh, vacillating between plus column and minus column for us. Let's take a look at CCL. CCL triggered yesterday. This was not the most beautiful setup in the world. Um, and it certainly probably would be one that I'd put into my um, course or as an example on the best way to pick stocks. But it did look like it was breaking down off of all-time highs. And then once it began to break down, as it is now, and you can see a little bit of a pullback in here. You also have a bow tie off all-time highs. All of this becomes overhead supply, and that's what I was thinking. Even though longer term, the stock's a little wide and loose, not the cleanest setup in the world. So my thinking is once it begins to break down, as it is today, below this overhead supply, it's going to have a hard time getting back through it. Let's take a look at DIY. I'm sorry, DY. This one's a nicely profitable so far for us. Again, another uh, bow tie down off of all-time highs. 
And by the way, right now, my focus is still in these stocks like this that are coming off of high levels that have the potential to come way down here as opposed to something like an oil field service stock, which has been downtrending for the last year or so. So we're trying to catch that first or now second leg down as opposed to hopping on a longer term trend. So you can see again, all time highs, bow tie, nice little slide out of that. So far, so good on that one. Uh, MOH, we got short a long time ago and we had a first thrust down and it also formed a bow tie too. By the way, you want to always look for those first thrusts first and then look for bow ties. Okay. But we'd have a nice thrust down and you can see it's been kind of a bumpy ride. But if you squint your eyes and just kind of draw a trend line through it all, it's been a pretty good ride lower. So, so far, so good on that one. And then the OZRK is a regional bank. And these regional banks have been absolutely decimated as of late. And, again, you have a bow tie here, pretty obvious, of all-time highs. When it comes to shorting, and if you go to my website, read the free report. You have to – I make you walk through the store – to get to it. So go to the store, scroll down to the bottom of the store and click on free reports and download the GoGo -Go Nomo. Now, as a general statement, the exciting stocks that I like to trade usually don't have a whole lot of fundamentals. Biotech, um, solar stocks when, when they're rallying, of course, semiconductors when they're rallying, of course, they don't have a whole lot of fundamentals. And they're very inefficient, meaning that the price moves aren't priced in. But on the short side, not that I won't trade those stocks, and there's a few on my radar now, but on the short side, I like stocks that actually have fundamentals. I don't actually go in and look at the fundamentals. But what happens is when stocks get at very high levels, and it's somewhat more efficient stocks, bigger cap, uh, brick and mortar stocks like a bank. You can quantify a lot of things about the bank or some sort of brick and mortar type of industry. And when that stock begins to roll over, things can get pretty ugly pretty fast. So as a general statement, you want to be in inefficient markets. But sometimes efficient markets can become inefficient. And if you read that article I talked about overhead supply and things that begin to play out as those stocks begin to roll over. So you'll notice that some of the stocks in here don't necessarily fit the mold of what you would normally see for a momentum guy like me because things are beginning to change in here. Okay. Let me know when we get rid of emotions. Well, um, as I often preach, and I, I picked up this from uh, Denise Schull, and she probably uh, picked up some of the research from uh, someone named Damasio. We can't eliminate emotions. We have to embrace emotions. I'm a pretty emotional guy. I, I cry like a schoolgirl at uh, at movies. <laughs> um, so I know I'm emotional. But you can't make any decision, any decision without emotions. Every, every decision you make, what to eat, when to wake up, when to go to bed, has an emotional consequence. So if you eliminated emotions, you couldn't make a trading decision. You couldn't make any decision. So you have to embrace them, and you have to know yourself, okay? I know that... If I put it a trailing stop, I can get about, get, a, get about my business and not sit there and watch every tick if, if I've got a currency up or something in the background or on one of the screens, okay? Uh, I know that if I watch too much of a market's move, I'll get all freaked out and pissed off or whatever, okay? Uh, Ozark, yesterday, I was watching it go straight up. And I'm like, ah, F-bomb, F-bomb. And then what happened by the end of the day? It came nearly all the way back in, okay? So if you watch too much, it starts stressing you out. You start a few, you start, that's a Mike Tyson thing, okay? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. You are no longer watching it from before. By the way, I don't want to digress, I don't want to digress too far. 
but I do play a lot of games at all to try to control my emotions or I should say control, but keep them in check. And when you're in a position, you're like being in the ring with Tyson, right? Which is probably not a good thing for at least most of us. Um, when you're not in a position, you can see things more objectively. So what I try to do sometimes is control my reactions to what's happening. I just I try to say, oh, that's interesting instead of F-bomb or whatever. It's kind of like the Southern – it reminds me of the Southern Finishing School. It's like um, this lady's going on and on about this and her house and all this, and this other lady's going, that's nice, that's nice, that's nice. You know, And she said, oh, she went to this place, this place, this place, and that's nice, that's nice. And then um, – at one point in time, the lady finally stops talking and says, so where did you go to school? And she's, she talks about this finishing school. She goes, well, what the heck did you learn there? And she said, well, we learned how to say that's nice instead of up yours, bitch. So it's kind of like it reminds me of that. So I, I try to say that's interesting, and I try to keep calm about it. And, and the main point I'm trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one, is that if you could – Sort of see it as happening and not happening to you. And, and one of the books on psychology somewhere, it's kind of like you, you kind of need to view it as watching a movie. And I'm guilty as charged as far as getting emotional, getting upset, screaming, hollering. But I try to embrace that. And as I've said a thousand times, a lot of times I'll get all pissed off and I'll just – slam my door to the office and go walk around the block, which is, in my case, is two miles because I live in the middle of nowhere. And I'll come back all sweaty. And uh, I'll look at my screens and everything is turned around. Now, obviously, it doesn't always turn around. But on many occasions, I've done that. And the market has turned around. And it makes me realize, why did I waste all that negative energy? Anyway, before I digress too far, uh, too late, huh? That's the portfolio. What's kind of interesting is, here's the other thing, too, I want to show you real quick. When you're in a position or even if you're looking at a market, whether you're in it or not, and sometimes just squint your eyes a little bit. And I like to draw a trend line through the bars. So even though the position is going against us a little bit today and yesterday, and let's do a linear regression trend line on top of it. Uh, this one here is a linear regression trend line. This one here is just a trend line drawn through the bar. So either one, you can use either one. You know me, I like to keep it simple. So obviously this downtrend remains intact. So until stopped out, just stay with the trend. I know, easier said than done. And follow that plan. Okay, let's take a look at uh, how does Marcy deal with that? My wife has a negative reaction to my yelling at my computer. Well, she doesn't see it. Uh, I, I have a little guest house uh, detached from the main house. And that's my office. So she doesn't know if I'm cussing and fussing or screaming in here. Um, but yeah, that's I guess it's a different thing if you're in, if you're in the house uh, room next to your wife and screaming and hollering. <laughs> um, so she 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 doesn't see it. But you, you you bring up a good point. Even though I'm by myself here, I need to try to think. Well, what if I was? in an office with other people or what if I was being watched or once, you know, not I say if, but uh, once I, sh once I begin to staff up because I, I obviously can't do everything anymore. Um, how will I act? Okay. So yeah, you have to kind of take that into consideration when you're trying to figure it all out. It's a dog house. Yeah. <laughs> Craig trains dogs. He's got a dog. You know, men who spend too much time in doghouse end up in cat house. So be careful. Craig says, right. So TA will never stop working. Emotions will always be the fact. I agree. Dave, if you could only use one thing, would it be a weekly bow tie? It's a good question. Um, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Let's see if I could be uh, not committal there. A weekly bow tie is a pretty good pattern. 
But keep in mind that anytime you're using moving averages, there's going to be some lag in your setup. And then if you're using a weekly chart, there's going to be some lag in that. The, the market's going to turn a lot quicker on a daily. Go back to 2009, and we had a plethora of daily bow ties and daily first thrusts and a lot of patterns like that. But the overall market took a while to turn. Now, with that said, even though it took a while to turn, it had a pretty good run once it made that bow tie. So the bow tie in here, it took a little while to turn. We were buying way back here on the daily chart, okay? But yeah, it's probably not a bad pattern to at least keep you on the right side of the market. Now, I wouldn't do them, I wouldn't trade them mechanically because it might take a long term time for that market to turn. Just like people say, well, the the, the death cross doesn't really test out. It, it does test out with a slight edge, but one thing you have to realize, once you're on that trend, if you measure it peak to trough, at least peak to trough from, let's call the signal the peak, and then the trough to low that it makes, the market has dropped as much as 80% from that death cross. And then by the same token, same thing with weekly bow ties. And if you go back to 2000 and nine peak the trough I mean it's 50 percent and you gave up a little bit of that but not much believe it or not it caught most of that that ride lower but obviously you don't want to sit around and let it retrace all the way back up it, you do have to have a money management plan in place but something like even the death cross or the bow tie or just a 50 week simple moving average even following the slope and the daylight of that can help to keep you on the right side of the market Martin says, David, no, you don't use VIA, but do you look, ever look at VWAP? No. To find out where the more majority position, position tra uh, traders are positioned? No. Uh, VWAP is just, uh, it's, it's, if you're an intraday trader, then maybe VWAP has some sort of meaning to you because an institution is going to look at VWAP. For people who don't know, VWAP is Volume Weighted Average Price. So the VWAP is something that tells an institution at a glance whether he's getting a good price or not as a general statement for the stock. So the broker is going to try to beat the VWAP to, in order to keep that client, okay? Um, but no, unless you're, unless you're on a micro level, I would avoid that. The only time I ever experimented with volume a little bit and I'm not this, you know, never say never. I'm not going to say I'll never do it again. Um, but back when I had a stockcharts.com account, which is something I'll probably turn back on at some point. I'm just, I've got a lot going on here. Uh, I did play with volume by price, which is not VWAP. VWAP, VWAP, however you want to call it, is, uh, is like an intraday thing. Volume by price shows you the volume of the market, but it puts it on the side. And what I found with it, even though I found it somewhat useful, but it, I found that your volume spike bars would be like right here. Well, okay, I could just look at the chart and see there was a lot of trading right there anyway. So uh, like any other indicator, it just kind of helps to show what's already in the chart. So there's nothing wrong with that. So I think if I had to use volume, it'd be volume by price. Now let's talk about the market. Oh, VWAP. Don wants to know what that is. Volume weighted average price is VWAP or VWAP, however you want to call it. VWAP, I guess. So if we're looking at, I don't know, pull a stock out the air, APL. Okay, let's look at Apple today. And let's take a look at the, let's take a look at a one minute chart on Apple, something stupid like that. Okay. And it might take a while to plot. So if we look at today's trading in Apple, and I don't know where it is. I'm just going to guess. But let's just say that it's been up towards 94 and down towards 93. But somewhere the average volume traded on this is going to be around 93 and a half. Okay. So if I'm a fund manager trying to buy or sell Apple, whatever the case may be, as long as I get around 93 and a half for it, uh, pay 93 and a half or whatever, let's just assume that's the VWAP, then I know that the broker – gave me a pretty good fill. So if you're intraday trading, if you're day trading, then 
maybe you could use that to your advantage, but I would suggest that you that you don't do that anyway. Newer TC2000 has volume by price. Okay, cool. Well, that's good to know. Okay, we'll get to that, Angelo. Okay, let's let's take a look at the overall market first. In fact, let's take a look at spiders first. Just so we get a um, a true open. So this market can't seem to get out of its way. And like I said, and like the Hang Sing we'll be talking about, obviously, last week and all, it has this persistency to it to the downside, meaning that it tends to go down day after day after day. And right now, it can't seem to get out of its own way. Yes, it's oversold and due to bounce because it sold off so hard, but that in and of itself is a reason to buy. So, so far, we just kind of pull back a little bit in here. And it tries to rally, but as soon as it rallies, it comes back in. Bull markets start weak and finish strong. Bear markets start strong and finish weak. Write that down. So if you look at what's happening today, is that we started strong, and now, so far at least, we're finishing weak. Market sold off from the open. And that's because people are selling into that strength, okay? In a bull market, people are buying the weakness. So never forget there's a lot of participants in this market. And when we're looking at a chart and we back the chart way out like this, we're reading the psychology of the participants. So if we take a look at uh, – let's take a look at the actual P's now. Let's go back to cash. I'll go to cash, I should say. Oops. Let me go to service. Okay, so we take a look at the S&P 500. And we back the chart out a little bit. We could see, like, this 1800. That's kind of an interesting spot here. And if we break below that, then obviously anyone up here who bought in this range is at a loss. And, and just even right now, I mean, let's not split hairs. Anyone above this, let's just say, 1850 round numbers, is at a loss right now. So as this market begins to drop, okay, never forget about the psychology of the market participants. So as this market begins to drop, it's going to put more and more pressure on these people who bought anywhere from, let's say, this level on up because they're not only watching their profits evaporate, easy for me to say, but now they're beginning to have a loss. So the psychology goes from losing, losing profits to losing capital. And sometimes return of capital is more important than return on capital. And that's what people forget. And when that sentiment begins to change, when those two begin to flip, then it starts getting fairly ugly pretty quick. Now, I seem certain that the market's headed lower. Do I know that? No. Of course not. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. The market can do whatever it wants. But as a trend follower, it sure looks like the longer term trend has turned. And it sure looks pretty ugly in here. NASDAQ opened to get reversal. Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, serious slide there. By the way, just not to beat the dead horse, but I'd be – I have to um, just continue to point it out. Weekly bow tie sell signal. Okay, triggers right here. Had a little bit of a retrace, didn't get quite back to new highs. Okay, at this level here, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Hey, it didn't work. Lick my wounds, move on, right? But now it looks like it's beginning to work. So the market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most and then do the obvious thing. And then the obvious thing to me, since last summer, it looked like it wanted to roll over. And now it's pretty ugly. How's that for oxymoron from a trend following moron? Let's take a look at the Rusty real quick. The Rusty's been ugly for a long, long time. And take a look at like a two-day chart here. Each bar is two days. And you can see way back here you had the bow tie down. Okay. The reason I like the bow ties when I'm – talking about the overall market, especially doing rollovers, even individual stocks, 
is because it's something very visual that you could actually see, okay? You might not see this slide here and this little pullback, but when you see the bow tie form like it does right here, Um, but it has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, it has too many days in the pullback. And it's also slightly on the thin side for shorting, and it also has a lot of support below. Okay. So I would toss that one out. But I think you could do much worse. I, I, I tend to agree with you. But it has too much support. Okay. All right, we have to go in the lightning round. All right, Art wants to know about MAA. He's waiting patiently. Thank you, Art. Hey. Uh, that's a REIT. I'm not really that excited about REITs. You know, do you really want to rush out and, and, and play the relative strength game now, meaning that you want to buy the stocks that are outperforming the market when the market itself is rolling over? Because here's the thing. If that market keeps rolling over, and so far I see no signs to the otherwise, then that falling tide is going to sink all ships. Plus, it's uh, it's low, and it's look, the HV is only 18. And then the other thing, too, if you are trading something like this, keep in mind that something bad could always happen. Okay. Okay, Matt says, you're still planning on follow-up courses, stock selection, IPO courses? Uh, yeah, I, eventually I will update every course. And my rule is if you buy a course and I update it, you can attend the free webinar when I do. And you get updates to the courses. So it's a lifetime. You're buying a course for a lifetime if you buy a course. Um, but everything I said, the stock selection webinar is still, or course I should say, is still very, very relevant. I don't have enough new material to update it. Um, I don't know if I have any new material to update it because everything is still relevant. What did I talk about? Overhead supply, uh, support below, uh, trade cleanly, persistency. All these things I talk about week in and week out. But, yeah. Is the lifetime offer a benefit or a curse? I don't know. What does that mean? <laughs> would you buy anything right now? Where would you have uh, – where you'd have to buck the trade. Well, RJ, not, I mean, the quick answer on that, because we're out of time, is uh, no. But if I do see a gold stock beginning to rally, something that could trade contracts to the market, or if I see a setup that just absolutely knocks my socks off, you know, it's like Jules said in Pulp Fiction, that would be, you know, he, Jules doesn't eat bacon. And um, you know, they got into this interesting conversation about bacon. And uh, Jules said that would have to be one charming pig. So if there's some amazing stock out there that looks fantastic, then by all means, I'll buy it. I'm just not seeing that right now. And if maybe a gold stock with not a whole lot of resistance above, which I'm not seeing just yet, or maybe over the next few weeks to few months, we could start seeing some of these all service stocks finally bottom out. You know, maybe that maybe this one last little throwing into the towel and then all of a sudden, these stocks are just start melting up with uh, bow ties, first thrusts, and all these type of patterns. And, yeah, I'll start, start buying. So I let the database tell me what to do, and I let the setups tell me what to do from the database. So right now, um, I can't pull up the Landry list but if you because of my, out of respect for my clients who are shorting these stocks. But if you go to the delayed service and just watch it or just go pull it up today, you'll see that there was, there was probably – all shorts and no longs going back a week, and that really hasn't changed just yet. So I let that database tell me what to do. All right, good bunch today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for coming. Sorry about the technical difficulties and late start that we had here. Uh, I love to do shows, as you can tell. This is a highlight of my week. Um, so thank you so much, and thanks for your patience again. Any unanswered questions, daviddavelandry.com. If it uh, requires a lengthy answer, It'll become fodder for next week's show, which I could always use material, so feel free to email me. Anyway, uh, if we don't talk between now and the weekend, everybody have a fantastic weekend, and then hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much.